What happens when one man tries to watch all of the sci-fi films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project, Sci-Fi 1981. Like I did for 1980, I figure we have to shine a light on the other genre films of the 80s. So we're once again doing the sci-fi edition of the 80s project. And to clarify, because you're, you're gonna see some things in here that you may not agree qualify as sci-fi, and, and I agree, but this is where you're gonna learn about any of the films released that follow under the category of genre. And that includes like fantasy stuff, superheroes, and kaiju. So let's get ready and see what's in store for 1981. Okay, I know that I'm sort of breaking my own rules here because this isn't a movie, but on January 5th, 1981, in the UK, the TV miniseries of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy debuted. I don't normally cover series, and, and, and the project is mainly about movies. I know I've done TV movies before, but I haven't done TV miniseries, but there's no way that I'm not going to talk about an adaptation of one of the greatest books of all time. We start off by meeting Arthur Dent, average human, who is dealing with the fact that his home is about to be destroyed, and his good friend, Ford Prefect, who is not human, but Arthur doesn't know that. Ford tells him, but also informs him that the Earth is about to be destroyed by an alien fleet, but luckily he has a means to escape onto the ship, while the planet is detonated below them. Now, it's pretty ballsy to start off your series with the planet literally being obliterated, but the pair then head out on a series of adventures, eventually meeting up with the stolen ship, the Heart of Gold, which travels through the use of an improbability drive and contains Marvin, the paranoid android, an old flame of Arthur's named Trillian, and the president of the galaxy. And if you're not familiar with this, it's based on a book by the great Douglas Adams and is possibly one of the most influential works of science fiction and comedy out there. It didn't actually begin as a book. It started as a radio play for BBC Radio back in 1978 and spun into different forms of media from there. The 81 series marked the first live action version of the story and used a number of actors from the radio show and ended up winning a number of awards and would run for six episodes, following our crew to the lost planet of Magrathea, visiting the restaurant at the end of the universe, and ending up on prehistoric Earth. On the way, they discover the secret to life, the universe, and, well, everything. And I'm giving this one a four and a half. Uh, this story means a lot to me, whether it's in book form, radio show, or this miniseries, which was actually my very first exposure to it all. I love it, even if some of the effects are painfully dated. Its science fiction cultural significance is a four, since it's the first attempt to put the tale on screen, but not the last, and won a ton of awards, but was never known in the States as much as it was overseas. Should you watch it? Absolutely, and don't forget to bring your towel. This must be Thursday. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. Our next entry is from January 30th, and it's The Incredible Shrinking Woman, directed by Joel Schumacher, his first theatrical film. It gives us Edwina Cutwater as a typical suburban mom, and Lily Tomlin actually plays several roles in the film, like selling herself beauty products, and her husband is Beethoven's dad. He works for an ad agency and is always bringing home new products for her to test out, and his boss is the mayor of Otisburg. And castor oil pops in for a second, and they soon notice that Pat has begun to get shorter. She goes for all sorts of tests with her doctor, uh, who's an Illinois Nazi, and he explains that the mixture of all the chemicals in her house have caused her to begin shrinking. Pretty soon, she's smaller than her kids and a national news story, and this one started out as a John Landis film, 
with a much bigger budget. But when Universal decided that they wanted to scale it back and, and took it from a $30 million picture to a $10 million one, he dropped a helicopter on someone. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I mean, he dropped out of the picture and Schumacher stepped in. A little later on in the picture, Daniel Clamp shows up as a villain, and the story is basically a parody of commercialism and the inundation of advertising and products, and was written by Jane Wagner, who is a regular collaborator with Tomlin, as the two are married and have been together since the 70s. There's also the inclusion of one of my personal favorites, Mark Blankfield, and a gorilla, and that, that suit was made by the legendary Rick Baker shortly before he won an Oscar for American Werewolf. And he actually plays Sidney the Ape. That's Baker inside the suit. And if you squint really, really hard, you can catch Julie Brown in one of her earliest roles. And when this one came out, it was pretty negatively reviewed, although it was fairly successful, earning just over 20 million, making back double its budget, which isn't really a huge hit, but is still a nice profit. And my rating on this one is a 3.5, since I have a bunch of nostalgia for this, and I saw it like a million times on cable. And even if it's not consistent, it's still entertaining. Its significance is a three, since it was a sort of remake of a sci-fi classic featuring a ton of known names, was Schumacher's first film, and contained work by Baker. Should you watch it? Yeah, sure, it's a fun time. On that same day, January 30th, there was a low-budget release called Earthbound, which starts off with Burr Lives, and there's just no possible way to hear this guy's voice without thinking of Christmas time. In your dream with all the horses in our hotel. Young Tommy's parents have died, and he's now living with his grandfather, and a mysterious object enters Earth's atmosphere. Stuart Pankin is here for everyone who used to watch not necessarily the news, and a spacecraft appears before a small town, causing chaos. Rumors are spread that the major cities have already been destroyed, but the aliens are actually a very human-looking family that seem to have some sort of powers, and also have this chimp with them that I guess uh, is like an alien that they claim to have found on their travels around the galaxies, like, like, like a space chimp. Ned and Tommy take them in while the military is on the hunt for them, and this one was directed by James L. Conway, who directed 1980's Hangar 18, which was also about humans encountering a UFO, but a dramatically different take than this. We'll also see him on the horror version of the project with The Boogans in 81, but then he pretty much switched entirely to directing TV series. And in fact, that's how this one started. It was meant as a pilot for a TV show that would follow this space family and their adventures on Earth, but it was turned down by every network. So it was then slightly re-edited and then released as a movie theatrically. Uh, it was promoted as a very spacey comedy, although the humor really isn't at the forefront. Like, it's more of a family film than anything. And it, it's got a small part for this guy, who I mostly know from Surf 2 and Under the Rainbow. And yeah, it's pretty easy to see how it was passed on for a series, and it didn't really make a dent at the box office either, and has sort of fallen into obscurity. My rating on it is a one and a half. It is pretty damn dull. Not, not, not a whole lot interesting going on, like, at all. Its significance is the same, since it's pretty much all but forgotten, and no one wanted it on their sets or their screens. Should you watch it? Uh, pass. This next one didn't have a confirmed date, but it's known that it came out sometime in 81 in Spain, and it's Sex is Crazy, and oh boy, another one that I may have trouble finding usable footage for. It involves aliens kidnapping Earth women in order to impregnate them, and their race has rapid natal periods, so they can have a baby every eight seconds. But it turns out to simply be a show where the audience is wearing masks. What, what, what's going on here? 
It's then this sort of stream of consciousness sort of thing with secret agents and microfilm, and of course, a variety of sexual shenanigans. But don't expect outright pornography here. This is strictly softcore stuff, and there's plenty of it. Enough that I'll probably have to keep this review on the shorter side because there's not enough scenes with people wearing clothes to use. But anyway, the director here is Jess Franco, and this is already the fourth film of his that I've covered on the project. Two in 1980, and two so far in 1981. And since the guy has 207 movies to his name, I'll probably have to cover a lot more. This one gets surreal when the characters we're following are made to simply be characters in a movie, and we often see the crew with Franco himself as the director, so it blurs the line of fantasy and reality. And for most of it, it's just this weird tale of these two couples and lots of hormones. But then, at like the one hour mark, we find out that actual aliens have seen the stage play and think it's a good idea and now want to use humans to breed. My rating on this one is a two. It's mostly just kind of dull, but some of the comedy lands, but for the most part, it's just not that intriguing. Its significance is just a one since it's very forgotten and just another blip on Franco's roster, even if it's one of his more surreal ones. Should you watch it? I, I'd say no. I mean, unless you really needed a softcore sex comedy fix. One last time was never the fucking world. What is now for wedding? Oh, it's time what the thing, eh? What's this? Then, on April 10th, we got the action sci-fi flick The Last Chase, which was a partially Canadian production, and we have a six million dollar man who has this new high-tech car, but gas is a commodity, and a good portion of humanity has been wiped out by a strange plague, including Hart's family. And there's no more cars, so everyone has to either walk or ride bikes. Oh, it's also a totalitarian dictatorship, and Hart is a spokesman for the mass transit system, but he finds out about a hidden territory called Free California that has seceded from the US. And then Rudy from Meatballs is here, and the two are forced to go on the run in Hart's revamped Porsche. The Penguin is in this one too, as a retired Air Force pilot that they bring in to track down and kill Hart. And this one was directed by Martin Burke, who didn't do a whole lot, but he did write the comedy classic Top Secret. And there was a hope with this film that it would allow Lee Majors to make the jump from television roles to a movie star, but while they were filming, his then wife, Farrah Fawcett, began a much publicized affair with actor Ryan O'Neill. It made for a rocky time for Majors, but he was contractually obligated to finish the film. Combined with the fact that this one ended up being financially unsuccessful, he ended up sticking with television and no longer sought out for leading man roles. It's a, a little bit Mad Max, a, a little Death Race 2000, but also a, a little bit of a, a buddy flick, but like a really watered down version of all of those. It was partially written by Christopher Crowe, who would later go on to write The Last of the Mohicans, and the film was built around his first draft, but then was drastically rewritten. It ended up so far removed from his original concept that he had his name removed from the film, and as stated before, it didn't do that well when it was released. Critics didn't care for it either, with most saying that the dramatic parts were dull, and the action sequences, well, they, they were dull too. And I agree, I, I give this one a two because I've seen this all before and I've seen it done livelier and I, I've yet to find a reason why, if gas was in such a major shortage, why they were able to have an airplane flying around uh, for such long periods of time. Uh, it's SFCS is a two as well because it has a couple of noted stars involved, but not much else. It, it's pretty forgotten, except for getting a spot on MST3K. Should you watch it? Y you can skip this one as well. We actually have a second entry on April 10th, and that one came in the form of the fantasy film Excalibur, one of the more prestigious releases in the genre. 
it's got this big battle in the Dark Ages, and Merlin is here, and he agrees to get Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. And, and, I, and I bet you thought this was going to be a chainsaw, didn't you? He gives it to King Uther, who is one of the usual suspects, and Merlin helps him with magic to bang his rival's hot wife. And they have a kid together, and that child is named Arthur. Shortly after, Uther is ambushed and killed, but in order to keep Excalibur from them, he buries it into a big rock. And Merlin says whoever draws it shall be the next king. Years later, the sword is still there, and not even Picard can pull it out, and he has mind powers, but they're, but they're better at making women's clothes fall off than pulling swords out. Teenage Arthur is here, and he just yanks that sucker out, and he quickly forms a crew and encounters the lovely Guinevere. And, and yeah, if you don't get it by now, this is a very serious version of the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table legend. It was directed by John Borman, who has a pretty spotty filmography. Like, he's got some amazing stuff, like Deliverance and Hope and Glory. But he also has Zardoz and Exorcist 2, which are amazing for completely different reasons. This was actually the first film he did after the disaster of Exorcist 2, and it began as an attempt to do Lord of the Rings. A lot of the imagery and the set design came from concept art developed for that, but when the studio couldn't commit to the budget, it ended up getting repurposed into this, with a far lower budget. It was a tricky shoot, with the opening battle being particularly difficult to get on film. Uh, twice, all of the footage came out underexposed and completely useless, causing them to shoot it for a third time. It's also got the outstanding Helen Mirren as Morgana, and I guess it was tricky putting her with Nicole Williamson, the actor who played Merlin. They, they had been in a stage show of Macbeth a little while back, and they had some difficulty getting along, to the point of refusing to speak to each other. However, while working on this film, whatever beef that they had was fixed, and they ended up becoming good friends. Also, the role of Gawain is filled by a very young dark man, very early on in his career. It was fairly expensive at the time, coming in at 11 million, although that wasn't too high of a budget, but the reviews were pretty mediocre. People lauded the scenery and all the visual aspects of the film, but criticized the direction, story, and lack of characterization. It did pretty well, taking in around 35 million, making it a hit, and it did get an Oscar nomination for the cinematography, although it lost out to Reds. And my rating here is a 3.5. It's a marvel to look at. Simply gorgeous. Uh, but the plot's a big mess, and I think that the acting is kind of forced and overwrought. Uh, but it just keeps on being beautiful. Its significance is the same, since it's pretty well known, if not a major blockbuster. Uh, has an assortment of names attached to it, and got an Oscar nom, but never pushed it further into mainstream relevance. Should you watch it? For, for sure. If, if you're familiar with Arthurian legend, it'll be interesting to see adapted. And if not, it's a cool but flawed story that's told beautifully. I destroy you. I consign you to this next little number is another TV movie, and it first aired on May 21st. And it's The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Dynamite. And if that title sounds familiar, it's because this is a sequel to last year's The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Everything. Now, in the first one, Kirby here was played by Robert Hayes, but he's now been recast, as has his fiancée, formerly played by Pam Dauber. Zora Lampert is back as Wilma, though, and we find out that the watch that stops time works for 20 minutes at a time, can only be used 6 times in 24 hours, and must be used once every 14 days, or will stop working forever. When Bonnie gets a letter from her mother saying that there's trouble on the farm, they head up to Sacramento to help out, making sure to take the watch. It seems like there's issues with the levee and the farm could be flooded out at any time. And how about this? They go to see the farm and Bonnie's dad is there and he thinks they're trespassing and he literally shoots at them. But Kirby stops time and pushes the bullets out of the way. Her dad is Dr. Nicholas Van Helsing, and this one was originally titled The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Everything Else, but it was decided that that title may have been too similar to the original, and that people would think it was the same movie, so they substituted Dynamite in there as well. 
It was directed by High Averback, who had been directing since the 1950s, and only did a few more things after this, but one of those things was the comedy Where the Boys Are. 2001's Frank is here, as does my, my, my girlfriend, Mor Morgan Fairchild. Yeah, that, that's the ticket. And of course, when it turns out that it's all just a swindle to get Bonnie's parents off the land by some developers, kicking off shenanigans, although it's all pretty low key. Although I guess it has a little more plot than the first one did. My rating on this one is a two. It does have some fun bits, but it's a movie about a guy with a watch who can stop time and he barely makes use of it. Its significance is a one though, since no one remembers it at all and it doesn't even have the star power that the first one had. Should you watch it? Probably not. I mean, this block seems to be full of this answer. Oh, and if anybody comes looking for me, tell them I'm down the street at the jewelry getting this old watch fixed up. Listen to this thing. Okay, this next one is a bigger deal, and on May 22nd, it's Outland. And it sets us on a mining station in orbit around Io. Io? Io? I, I don't know, whatever. A moon of Jupiter. And we see one of the miners have a psychotic break and tear open his spacesuit. The moon's marshal, who named the dog Indiana, is newly stationed there, and the mine's general manager is putting on the Ritz. Shortly after, Another one also kills himself through decompression at the same time that O'Neill's wife unexpectedly heads back to Earth, leaving him on his own. But then, when it seems like the crew members losing their minds is occurring more and more frequently, and they soon discover it's because they've been taking a new drug that increases their productivity rate, but it also drives them insane. He soon discovers that the drugs are being supplied by Shepard, and his own sergeant is in on it, and he has to try to take the drug ring down on his own. So this one was directed by Peter Hyams, who had already dipped his toes into the sci-fi world with Capricorn 1, and would later do some stuff of varying degrees of quality, like, like 2010, Time Cop, Stay Tuned, and End of Days. The film came about because he wanted to make a western, but was told that westerns don't sell. So he made one anyway, but just set it in space. Instead of the western frontier, he made it the final frontier, and was greatly influenced by the classic High Noon. It's not so much as to be a direct remake, but the inspiration is obvious. But it also took a good deal of its vibe from Alien, and considering that both films had the same producer, there's fan theories out there that place them both in the same universe, since they both feature a shadowy corporation in charge of everything that's simply referred to as the company. Upon release, it was met with mixed results. Reviews went either way, with some praising it and others calling it dull and uninteresting. The box office went the same direction since it did well in the big cities, but failed to land with less populous areas, and it would go on to make slightly more than it cost. The budget was 16 million, and its final take was around 20 million, which isn't really a disaster, but it's certainly not a success either. It did, however, earn an Oscar nomination for Best Sound, although it lost to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I'm giving this one a 3.5. I, I like what it's doing for the most part, but it it's just so damn dry. Like, I, I don't mind a slow pace, but this just doesn't really take advantage of its setting or tone enough for me. Its sci-fi cultural significance is a 3, since it is a little more known, but it never really made it to mainstream success. It also gets points for a big cast, Hayam's involvement, and getting that nomination. Should you watch it? Yeah, I, I think it's worth the time. We now jump to another one that has an unknown date, but it's Life Pod, not to be confused with 1993's Life Pod. And this has an ad for a ship going to Jupiter with a trademark in 2191. So we're in the pretty far future. But on its maiden voyage, there's an emergency and they have to abandon ship. People get away on various life pods, but some of the crew are still on board. And we meet Simmons here, who meets up with Fiona, played by Christine DeBell, who was in Meatballs, Tag the Assassination Game, and A Talking Cat? Question mark? But of course, IMDb lists her most known film 
As the one X-rated movie she did, they end up finding a group of others who are still there as well and have to try to find their way to a life pod. And oh my god, is that freaking Mantis? It is! There's this sort of robot thing with a laser on it keeping them in line, but there's a secret passage that they're able to use to get to a pod. But the captain stays behind, and the ship's computer is trying to convince them to come back, and our director here is Bruce Bryant, and it's the only thing he's ever directed, although he has a considerable amount of work in other aspects of the industry, and seems to have found his niche in TV title sequences and has done the opening title graphics for shows like Frasier, Ro Roseanne, and Cheers. And this was one of a whole bunch of super cheap sci-fi flicks pumped out in this era by producer Robert Emenegger, who did the killings at Outpost Zero around this same time and just tried to get as many inexpensive genre flicks as he could out there in a short time span. And yeah, after the first like 15 minutes with them hustling to get onto the life pod, it then just sort of goes into this whole nothing much happens mode as everyone just sits around talking for a while. And by a while, I mean like the next hour. So yeah, I'm gonna give this a 1.5 because it is just it's so dull. And, and, and I know I've had a few clunkers on this list, but this is the biggest yawner here. I I'm just not sure what they were even going for with this one. Its significance is a one since it's completely forgotten and features no recognizable names really, either in front of or behind the camera. Should you watch it? Absolutely skip it unless you're having a party and it's getting late and you want your guests to leave. All right. <laughs> Oh, this next one is an epic, and it came out on June 12th, and it's The Clash of the Titans, a movie that anyone with cable in the 80s has seen a million times. It begins with a king casting his daughter to the sea in an effort to prevent a prophecy, and Zeus is here, played by Lawrence Dame Olivier, class of class and things up, and Honey Rider is here too. Dame Maggie Smith steps in, and the King of the Gods is pissed that Acrisius killed his daughter and unleashes the Kraken to destroy his kingdom. Meanwhile, Danae's child grows up safely and becomes Harry Hamlin. And, and look, if this were any other movie and I saw Harry Hamlin, I would call him Perseus. So here, that's what I'm going to call him. He gets set on a quest, but at least he has Mickey in his corner, and some gifts from Zeus, like a helmet, and a sword, and shield. His adventures have him encountering giant buzzards, the Pegasus, the Twisted Calabus, who, who I used to have as an action figure of, and, and was the only one I had from this film, so, so he fought G.I. Joe a lot. He also gets the movie's breakout star, the Clockwork Owl, Bubo. And, and the director on this one was Desmond Davis, and he was mostly a TV director, and in fact, hadn't done a feature film for about 13 years before this. But, since he had done several Shakespeare films for the BBC, they thought that he would be a perfect fit for the role. Now, the special effects may look a bit outdated now, but they were the work of the legendary Ray Harryhausen, one of the great innovators of stop-motion work. He created all the stop motion on this one, including Calabos, the giant bird, the Pegasus, the Kraken, Medusa, and the Scorpions. It would go on to become the final film to feature his work since the advent of more advanced technologies made his stuff like less desirable, leading him to retire. At one point in the process, the film was shopped to several studios, and one of the contenders was Orion Pictures, but they would only shoot it if Arnold Schwarzenegger took the lead, so no deal was made, since producer Charles Shear didn't think that he'd be able to handle the amount of dialogue necessary. The reviews were pretty favorable, with most critics enjoying it, although it did get a share of criticism as well, and it was fairly costly for the time period, with a budget of around $15 million. It came out on the same day as Raiders of the Lost Ark, some, some tough competition, and took the number two spot, but still did quite well overall. It earned around 40 million in the US and around 70 million worldwide, making it one of the biggest hits of the year. And I think it's because they all saw how amazing this stop motion Medusa was. Like, like seriously, this thing is great. 
And my rating on this one is a four. It's a classic and I have pretty fond memories of it. I I'm not sure that it aged that well though, but, th but that's, that's a pretty minor issue. It it's still a ton of fun. It's FSCS is a 4.5 though, since it's widely remembered, beloved, contains a ton of star power, and was the final film for the great Ray Harryhausen. Should you watch it? By the gods, yes. June was a big month for sword and sorcery type flicks because a little later on that month, on June 26, Dragon Slayer was released. In it, the supreme being is a wizard and Janos is his apprentice and a town that is beset upon by a dragon needs his help since he's the last sorcerer. In an effort to prove that he's as magical as he says, he allows himself to be stabbed, which of course kills him. Galen is then left to deal with the problem on his own after he discovers his own magical abilities through the use of the wizard's amulet. The town has been sacrificing virgins to the dragon and he discovers that Valerian is actually a girl posing as a boy to avoid being offered. When they think that he stopped the dragon by sealing off its cave, they all celebrate, but it turns out to be premature as the beast returns as Galen loses his amulet. He is then left to team up with Valerian to try to end the dragon's reign of terror and save the village. And this one was handled by Matthew Robbins, who had a pretty interesting career. As a director, he's only done eight things, with five being films. One was Corvette Summer, a comedy. Then this, a fantasy film. Then The Legend of Billy Jean, whatever you want to categorize that as genre-wise, I do not know. And then Batteries Not Included, a little sci-fi comedy. And then a movie called Bingo, a family film about a dog. But he's been more prolific as a writer and has worked quite a bit with Steven Spielberg, but also is a frequent collaborator with Guillermo del Toro. It was a pretty large budget, costing 18 million to make, which is more than Excalibur, or Clash of the Titans, the other two fantasy films of this year, and a large portion of that went to the dragon effects. It's said that a full quarter of the budget went to making it come to life using several different methods. There were large practical props and miniature effects, and a new stop motion technique was created specifically for this film called Go Motion. Instead of taking a picture of a still model, and then moving it slightly, and then taking another picture of it to simulate motion, here the model was mechanized to have slight movements. When the shots were taken, the minor motion is captured, and then when put together to create a more smooth and fluid look for the movements, as opposed to the standard stop motion. The dragon is often cited as the coolest part of the film, and both Guillermo del Toro and Game of Thrones writer George R. R. Martin have declared it to be the greatest dragon ever put on film. When released, critics embraced it and gave it glowing reviews, praising the effects and the story, but unfortunately, audiences didn't react the same way. It only made 14 million at the box office, branding it a bomb. Although, over time, it's become a cult classic. It did get nominated for an Oscar for the score, though, but lost out to Chariots of Fire, which I get because, <laughs> oh great, now I have that theme in my head. And my rating on this one is a four as well. I, I think it's pretty great. Like, I, I wish that the pacing was a little bit better, though, because it gets a bit laggy in the middle of it, but it, it's a minor quibble. Its significance is a 3.5 since it's pretty known and remembered, advanced special effects quite a bit, including creating new stop motion technology, but since it never really made it that big, I, I can't get much higher. Should you watch it? Yes, it holds up pretty well and that dragon is banging. So here's where this list is going to liven up because on July 10th, we get the release of John Carpenter's Escape from New York. It did have a premiere a bit earlier in April and also debuted a few places earlier that summer, but July 10th is when it went wide and it gives us the far future of 1997, in which Manhattan is now a large prison that has been walled off and monitored. But 
when Air Force One is the subject of a hijacking, the president, Sam Loomis, is launched in an escape pod that lands right in the heart of it. Fortunately, they had just arrested former war hero turned criminal and all-around rude guy, R.J. McCready. Or, I mean, Elvis. Or, I mean, Santa Claus. Or, I don't know, I mean, uh, Jack Burton. Uh, no, no, wait, I got it. It's Snake Plissken. And he's given 24 hours to go into New York City, retrieve the president, and get him out. Or else a bomb goes off inside his head. The always amazing Tom Atkins is here as well, as is the man who shot Liberty Valance. I actually don't think he did the shooting, but you know what I mean. So of course, this is by John Carpenter, his follow-up to The Fog. And at this point, he was on a roll since Halloween was a major hit, and The Fog did pretty well too. And this script was something he had been sitting on since the 70s, and he wrote it in the wake of Watergate. The public was feeling pretty skeptical about the presidency, and this script reflected that. And at the time, no one would produce it. But since he had built up some clout now, he was able to get it bankrolled. And here's a little tidbit. Before they went into production, Carpenter became concerned that his version of the script was a little too straightforward of an action story, and was missing some of the more satiric elements that he thought the concept needed. So he brought in Nick Castle the actor who portrayed Michael Myers in the first Halloween to help him out. Castle added in some comedic elements, created the character of Cabby, and is responsible for the entire ending of the film. And then, the company funding the film weren't really keen on having Russell as the lead, considering that he had just done a run of Disney productions and the comedy Used Cars and they wanted a more distinct action leading man, suggesting someone like Charles Bronson for the gig. But Carpenter said that Charlie was too old and wanted someone a little newer to the game. With a price tag of around six million, the film did quite well, bringing in around 25 million, cementing the director as a man who could deliver box office profits, if not mega blockbusters. The reviews were pretty favorable as well, with most critics praising its weirdness and satirical nature. Of course, a sequel did happen, but not for another 15 years. But there's also been comic books and a game marking Pliskin's place in history. And my rating on it is pretty strong, and I'm gonna give this one a 4.5, and it's just it's just so great. Like Carpenter says it's his favorite of all of his films, and, and I don't quite agree there, but it's up there. Its significance is the same at a 4.5, since it's widely known and gave one of the genre's defining anti-heroes, plus a huge roster of stars and Carpenter's backing. This is one of the biggies. Should you watch it? Yes, you have 24 hours to do so or else that bomb in your head is gonna go off. This episode ends on August 7th with the pretty epic release of Heavy Metal. It kicks off in the best way possible as an astronaut descends to Earth in a Corvette to the sounds of Radar Rider. That astronaut then opens up a case with a glowing green orb that kills him and begins to tell his daughter that it's the Loch Nahr and it tells her stories in which it is the prime objective of the characters. And if you're not aware, Heavy Metal is a comic magazine from France known as Metal Hurlant there and is licensed here. It's been running since 1977 and features an anthology of science fiction stories, mostly with an adult bent. The film is sort of the same thing, adapting some of the more popular tales from the title, adding the framing sequence and presence of the Loch Nahr to bridge them together. The first story is called Harry Canyon, based on a Mobius tale, and has John Candy showing up to lend his voice, and is a futuristic take on a film noir, and the original comic inspired the look of Blade Runner. The second tale is an adaptation of Richard Corbin's sci-fi sword and sorcery epic, Den. Candy also shows up here as the title character, and it's essentially a kind of Conan in space. The third story is based on a character from Swamp Thing legend Bernie Wrightson called Captain Stern and has an assortment of SCTV stars including Eugene Levy as Stern and Joe Flaherty as his lawyer and also has John Vernon as the judge. 
Next is a World War II zombie tale that's an original tale from Dan O'Bannon, So Beautiful and So Dangerous, a tale of aliens and robots arriving on Earth, based on an Angus McKee tale from the comic, and also has Candy Levy and Flaherty, but also adds Harold Ramis in there. Hey, do we have any of that Plutonian Nyborg left? Uh, yeah, just one big. Uh, it's in the transmitter compartment. Oh, thanks, man. The final sequence is probably the most iconic, and it's Tara, based on another Mobius tale, although it differs quite drastically, and it's more of an inspiration for, as opposed to an adaptation, and has the introduction of the warrior woman, Tarna, who is featured on the film's poster. Each section had a different team with a variety of writers and directors, and it was produced by Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman. It used a variety of different animation techniques handled by different teams, allowing for a quicker turnaround time for the sequences, and got mixed reviews. Audiences liked it though, and it was a modest hit, landing 20 million at the box office against a budget of nine. Home releases got a bit tricky though, since there were some legal issues with the songs featured in the film. Some of the contracts were only for the theatrical release of the film, so when it came time for the home release, they were unable to use those songs. It wasn't until 1996 that it got a proper release with the original music, thanks to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle co-creator Kevin Eastman. He purchased the rights to the magazine and reached a settlement with the rights holders of the songs, allowing it to be delivered to the VHS world and beyond. There was a sequel to the film released in 2000, appropriately called Heavy Metal 2000, although it's not quite as well remembered. And of course, there's remake talks that have been going on since 2008, although they always seem to kind of get waylaid. Although one of those reboot attempts ended up getting retooled and retitled and became the Netflix series Love, Death, and Robots. There was also a two season live action version in France called the Metal Hurlant Chronicles that featured some name talent and a decent budget. My rating on it is a 3.5. I have a fair amount of nostalgia, but I have to admit that the animation doesn't really hold up and it is, it's a bit uneven. Its cultural significance is a four since it's very fondly remembered, even if it never really broke into the mainstream. I think the magazine may have more of a relevance, but the movie itself is a bit behind that. Should you watch it? Yeah, you should and get ready to rock out. A shadow shall fall over the universe and evil will grow in its path, and death will come from the skies. So there you have it, the first block of sci-fi and genre flicks from the year 1981. There's gonna be two episodes of this. Uh, I'm not quite sure when the second one will be out, but it'll be in the fairly near future. And my favorite movie on this block is, very clearly Escape from New York. It was a tough call because of how much I love Hitchhikers, but I have to say, um, that the TV miniseries is probably not my favorite take on the story, even though I do love it. Um, Escape from New York definitely gets that nod of my favorite from this block. Let me know what yours is down below in the comments. I wanna hear it. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines, and you can help support the channel and keep this going. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the sci-fi of 1981 which you've just now watched on The 80s Project.